Hello and welcome to Grasping Reason, a channel about the big ideas of history, philosophy and art. This time in the pre-Socratic series we take a look at Anaxagoras. Anaxagoras is thought to have been born around the turn of the 5th century BCE and lived until around the age of 72. He is known as Anaxagoras of Clazomenae, which was a city in the Greek-speaking region of Ionia, on the western coast of the Anatolian Peninsula in modern-day Turkey. He moved to Athens when he was an adult, and it is thought that it is in Athens that he was philosophically active. Athens became known for being a centre of ancient philosophy thanks to both Plato and Aristotle being from there. But Anaxagoras is the first major figure in philosophy to be associated with the place. He was known as a close companion of the great Athenian statesman and general Pericles. Eventually, that close companionship with a leading politician would yield predictable results, and Anaxagoras became embroiled in a trial on his character that would see him exiled from the city. He moved then from Athens to a city known as Lamsacus, on the eastern side of the Hellespont, again in modern-day Turkey, where he would die. His life may be interesting enough to make a decent film out of it, but that's not the subject of this video. We will be looking at his philosophy instead. And on that topic, there is a lot to be said. I mentioned in the video on Parmenides, and perhaps mentioned it again in every video of the later pre-Socratics, but Parmenides was kind of a big deal in the evolution of pre-Socratic thought. He was the first known ontologist, asserting that what is, is, and what is not, is not. In philosophical terms, he denied the possibility of becoming or passing away. In my video on Parmenides, I mentioned that this principle was delivered like a lesson in logic, and it was certainly treated by every subsequent pre-Socratic philosopher as a serious challenge that needed to be met. Anaxagoras is no different here, and his approach to Parmenides' challenge is one of broad acceptance. The Hellenes follow a wrong usage in speaking of coming into being and passing away, for nothing comes into being or passes away. So, for Anaxagoras, what exists, exists now, has always existed, and will always exist. If we rule out becoming and passing away entirely, then this must be what Anaxagoras means, right? Well, this fragment continues. For nothing comes into being or passes away, but there is a mingling and separation of things that are, so they would be right to call coming into being mixture and passing away separation. I will discuss mixture and separation in more detail a little later, but for now it is important to contextualise what becoming and passing away means for Anaxagoras. The desk in front of me was created at some point. Before it came to me, the many pieces were constructed, and a handy guide was made which advised me how to put the pieces together when I took possession of it. There is a definite point of time in which this desk came to be before which this particular desk didn't exist. It appears from the quoted fragment that this wouldn't trouble Anaxagoras. Analysis of this point in Anaxagorean philosophy makes some important distinctions between what exists that is subject to the principle of non-becoming and what may be produced in that context. For Anaxagoras, it is broadly believed to be his view that there is a reality for the things that make up the world. We might call them elements, but for Anaxagoras this is not exclusively the four elements that we see in Empedocles and others, rather a broad term that encompasses all things that can be used to constitute an object. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy explicitly discusses this distinction. Things such as earth, water, fire, hot, bitter, dark, bone, flesh, stone or wood are metaphysically basic and genuinely real, in the required Eleatic sense. They are things that are. The objects constituted by these ingredients are not genuinely real. They are temporary mixtures with no autonomous metaphysical status. They are not things that are. So, to make the point absolutely clear, for Anaxagoras, the principle that denies becoming or passing away refers to the constituent ingredients that make up the world. These things exist now and forever. The things that can be constructed from these ingredients only come to be 
as a temporary mixture of the eternal ingredients, and only pass away as an eventual separation between those ingredients. In everything, there is a portion of everything. If that first principle just discussed can be seen as a straight affirmation of Parmenidean ideas, the other parts of Anaxagorean ontology can be seen as implications derived from that affirmation. The principle that all things are in everything is one of those implications. We'll be looking at the cosmogony shortly, but it is important to highlight that the state of the cosmos before any distinct object is generated is one in which all the real things that are, are present in all places at once. To avoid passing away when a distinct object is generated, Anaxagoras appears to believe that none of the constituent things can be extinguished fully from that object. If we have a gold ingot, we may call it pure gold. Yet in every part of it, there is portions of every other possible real thing, every ingredient. This must be an even distribution, in the sense that you cannot find a part of the ingot which you could cut off to get to a truly pure chunk of gold. Everything is in everything, in all places, at all times. As much as this prevents a passing away of any particular ingredient, it also prevents becoming. If the mixture of ingredients in that gold ingot are allowed different amounts of their portions, we would get a different distinct object. But this new generation has not had any new ingredients added to it or any taken away, satisfying, at least for Anaxagoras, this requirement of non-becoming. Inherent in the principle just stated is the assertion that there can be no smallest thing. As the third extant fragment states, Nor is there a least of what is small, but there is always a smaller, for it cannot be that what is should cease to be by being cut. But there is always something greater than what is great, and it is equal to the small in amount, and, compared with itself, each thing is both great and small. Our gold ingot, as I mentioned, cannot yield a piece of pure gold by cutting away the gold part of it. The freshly cut piece of gold will also not yield purity by further cutting. The idea is that you could always go smaller, but that there will always be a portion of every ingredient in any sized piece of an object. The assertion that there is also no largest thing seems to be an appeal to the same principle, that there is always a portion of everything in any part of an object. No matter what size it gets to, there is never more ingredients in one object than any other. Given that we are being told that the small and the great are also equal, I think it's safe to assume that this principle is not talking about smallest and largest in the sense of relative size. This principle is only lightly explained, and more so in terms of denying a smallest than a largest thing. This of course leads to some different interpretations. The SEP takes it to be an issue of degree of submergence or emergence in the mixture. This anticipates the next principle I'll talk about but for now it is enough to say that a particular ingredient takes up a proportion of an object. If it is not a defining ingredient, then that proportion is at least so small as to be unapparent in the object. It is submerged. If it is a defining ingredient, like gold in a gold ingot, then its proportion is such that it is apparent. That ingredient is emergent. Applying this principle leads us to believe that no matter the current state of emergence or submergence, each ingredient can become further sub or emerged without ever reaching a point where that or any other ingredient passes away. In the pre-Socratic philosophers, this principle is taken to be more of a statement about infinity. Both the infinitely great and the infinitesimally small alike contain an infinite number of portions. In this interpretation, the great and the small are equal because they both have an infinite number of portions. Being larger does not give a greater infinity, for example. All this may lead us to the question of, if everything is in everything, 
and there is no distinction to be made by size, then what allows us to define an object as that particular object? As I noted a few moments ago, this principle includes the notions of submergence and emergence. Let's look at our gold ingot example again. Of all the ingredients that exist in our gold ingot, and let us remember that all of the basic ingredients in the cosmos exist in every part of this ingot, one of these ingredients is predominant, namely gold. Gold is the most emergent of all the ingredients in our ingot. Pure gold can be understood as a metal in which only the ingredient of gold is emergent. All other ingredients are submerged beyond the point of apprehension, but still never extinguished completely. This isn't just the case for gold ingots. Something is hot, if hot predominates over the cold in it. Flesh, if flesh predominates over other ingredients, and so on. The cold still exists, but is submerged in the hot thing. Wheat exists, but is submerged within flesh. We cannot say either is fully submerged, if we take the SEP interpretation of smallest and largest, as there is always a further submergence that could happen. But these things are submerged to the point of no longer being apparent in the particular object. In every case, an object may be defined by the fundamental ingredients that are apparent to us. Those ingredients that are emergent over all other ingredients. There is something that is unlike all of the ingredients though and yet appears to be a sort of ingredient itself. I started the section on everything in everything with a snippet from fragment 11, which only served to state the principle in that section. Here is the fragment in full. In everything, there is a portion of everything, except noose, and there are some things in which there is noose also. Noose is a word that comes up a lot in Greek philosophy, and it means mind or intellect. Here in the UK, we sometimes use the word to mean something like common sense and pronounce it as nous when we do. But in philosophy, it refers to mind more generally and for some reason I've always kept the two definitions distinct by using a different pronunciation for them. That tidbit aside, nous plays a significant role in Anaxagorean philosophy. We've been told that it is present in some things but not all. That alone sets it apart from any other ingredient, and perhaps that is enough to not really consider it an ingredient at all. The twelfth extant fragment is the longest, and it concerns itself exclusively with this concept. In that fragment we are told that noose is infinite, and is not mixed with anything else, for if it was, it would have power over nothing in the same way that it has now being alone by itself. A mixture with any ingredient would mean a mixture of all ingredients, and that would be a limiting factor on noose. This would be unacceptable for an Axagorian noose, which acts as an instrumental force in the construction of the cosmos. It has all knowledge about everything and the greatest strength, and noose has power over all things, both greater and smaller, that have life, and noose had power over the whole revolution so that it began to revolve in the beginning. Mind, or nous, is a motive force then. It directs all things that have life, and is present in those things. It also directs the revolution, which can be understood as the whirling of the cosmos, by which distinct objects are separated out from the initial state of full, undefined mixture. It begins that revolution, and it sustains it. By setting aside an infinite and powerful force such as Nous from the ingredients, we see a departure from Parmenidean principles. Parmenides would not have allowed that you could have an infinite thing that is distinct from anything else. It is difficult to know for sure what is the full character of Nous in Anaxagoras. The word itself might suggest a fully rational entity that has no physical characteristics thereby having a character of infinity that does not clash with the infinite character of the physical ingredients. 
Anaxagoras does give it some physical characteristics though, noting its fineness in the same fragment. Without further clarification from Anaxagoras, there is debate about how we should interpret this concept. All that we can say for sure is what I've already mentioned. It is infinite, yet it is not present everywhere. This is a motive force in all living things, and while not being present in all things, it has the power to direct existence when taken as a whole, at least so far as to initiate and sustain the whirling of the cosmos. Now that we have covered the essential principles of Anaxagorean ontology, we can look at how they were applied by him to the physical world. We know that there are basic ingredients in the world, and that they are everywhere all at once. Anaxagoras gives us some examples of what these ingredients are over the course of his fragments, and we've seen some of those examples already. Hot and cold, fire and water, flesh and wood. These examples have indicated the scope of this concept, including the elements that other pre socratics use like fire, natural materials that to the ancient Greek eye could not be reduced to constituent parts like wood, and even properties of a thing like hot. No exhaustive list of all these ingredients is ever provided, but perhaps the scope of the examples would have made his contemporaries perfectly aware of what should be included as an ingredient. These things, we are told, are entirely real, and therefore cannot ever pass away or come to be. They are all, in everything, at all times, but in a state of either submergence or emergence in particular objects. The principle of predominance determines what an object is by recognising which of the ingredients are emergent in it. Composite objects, such as my desk, are described as temporary mixtures of the ingredients, and are not real in the same sense as those ingredients. They can be created and destroyed, but the ingredients from which they are composed cannot be. In the fourth fragment, Anaxagoras brings up the notion of seeds of all things. In the context of that fragment, these seeds appear to be an important step in the generation of distinct objects from the premixed state of ingredients. The suggestion seems to be that a seed holds the plan of a distinct object, and we might assume that a particular mixture of ingredients adheres to the plan in the seed. Yet, the word is mentioned exactly twice in the same fragment, and there is doubt over whether the second mention is actually Anaxagoras' own words. Maybe this is a mostly lost element of Anaxagoras' philosophy, that could describe the generation of objects more completely if only we had more talk of it in the extant fragments. Given how Anaxagoras talks of Nous in the twelfth fragment, however, I find it odd that seeds are not mentioned there also, if they actually held that importance in his philosophy. I'm left thinking that it was a flowery but clumsy way to describe the actions of Nous on the ingredients. If I'm wrong or right, regardless, there is too little evidence either way. What we do have evidence for is that for Anaxagoras, the ingredients are combined in ways that produce distinct, temporary objects by a mixture and separation. This, as we discussed earlier, begins with a push towards motion by Nous. We might imagine that before this initial push, everything was a mass of the ingredients without much distinction. The push rotated this mass, and with that rotation, the proportions of ingredients became less equal and began to allow for further distinction. And when Nous began to move things, separating off took place from all that was moved, and so far as Nous set in motion, all was separated. And as things were set in motion and separated, the revolution caused them to be separated much more. This separating off does not isolate any ingredient completely but it does create areas of predominant materials so that we get, for example, instances of fire as predominant in a particular area. This initial push towards a rotation, then, is how the cosmos is generated in its entirety. Fragment 15 indicates that heavier objects began to mass at the centre of the revolution, and lighter objects are flung outwards. 
so that we get the rocky planet beneath us at the centre and the fiery stars so far away from us. The rotation continues forever and there is never a shortage of ingredients being introduced to it, and the effects of the rotation never ceases on those objects already inside of it. It is easy for modern readers to sit on centuries of scientific advancement and regard this view as ridiculous. To the ancient Greek eye, however, the passage across the sky of the moon, the sun and the stars would surely indicate to observers that they are sitting in the centre of some kind of whirlpool. For someone concerned with explaining the world around them at this time, this idea of a whirling mass of objects can be a good starting point for investigation. This rotation is used to explain meteorological phenomena, such as a heavy rock occasionally slamming into the earth, an event that Anaxagoras is sometimes suggested to have predicted. Sometimes objects may also be lifted away from the earth, beginning their passage towards the outer edges of the rotation. On their way outwards, they may pass in front of one of the bodies that circles the Earth, occluding these bodies temporarily and producing an eclipse. We are told that Anaxagoras concerned himself with a complete and thorough explanation of the world, although evidence for most of these interests is now lost to us. I think we are safe to assume, however, that the principles discussed here and the rotation in which they occur would be the basis for all of these explanations. Before I end this video, it is worth making some notes about Anaxagoras' position in pre-Socratic history. While he certainly didn't have the same impact on his peers as Parmenides clearly did, Anaxagoras' ideas were still respected by the other thinkers of his time. His scientific explanations of cosmological phenomena became a model for further study. Once his views about meteors, hail and eclipses became known, such topics were always included in scientific accounts of astronomical and meteorological phenomena. His association with Athens can even be considered significant, given that the city became synonymous with philosophy in the century after him. The giants of philosophy that followed him, Plato and Aristotle, both hailed from that city and treated his ideas well. Their own philosophies cannot be divorced from the broader discourse in that city, which began with Anaxagoras. While in the Apology, Socrates is unkind towards Anaxagoras, Plato still in other places seems to be evolving Anaxagorean ideas. And the mere mention in the Apology shows just how influential Anaxagoras must have been to the youth of Athens at that time. With that said, let's leave behind Anaxagoras for now. Thank you all for watching and for pressing the good YouTube buttons. If I missed anything important, let me and other viewers know in the comments below the video. Have a great day and goodbye.